Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another live edition of Mike Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. Our podcast series features several athletes, past and present. Joining me is a former basketball athlete who now spends her time chronicling the next generation of athletes as a multimedia specialist, a freelance photographer. Her work has been featured in Sports Illustrated, the WNBA, Bleach Report, and Slam, just to name a few of the organizations. And this week, she announced that she is the newly minted social content lead for Locker Room, an audio app that, like this podcast, gives you an in-depth examination of the people who make our sports community thrive, whether they're athletes, coaches, fellow media members. And I'm looking forward to talking shop with Rihanna Lewerke, a graduate of Northern Iowa. Rihanna, thanks for joining us. And what would you make of this journey? Your biography mentions how you grew up as this kid from Iowa, Mason City, went to Northern Iowa, no pro sports. You take a leap of faith to work your way up in Minnesota. And since then, you have forged a lot of high entry. Yes, yeah, high value entries on the resume is the best way of putting it. What would you make of this journey? Yeah, um, it's been crazy. Honestly, I would have never guessed to be here um, five years ago. Uh, And I, you know, in college, when I was in college from 2012 to 2016, I was studying public relations. I thought I'd end up at like an agency, maybe in sports doing like PR and press releases. And I ended up in like the world of media and creativity and social and covering sports. And I like literally, if I would have like had any idea five years ago what I'd be doing now, I would not have believed you. So I feel truly blessed. And honestly, Minneapolis, like I feel lucky to be here because there's just been so many incredible athletes uh, to tell stories about the past few years and opportunities through these athletes and coaches and teams and just like the job that I started out with um, that put me in places that I could have never dreamed of being in as somebody who's getting paid to be there. So Um, So far, so good on the journey. I honestly feel very grateful to be where I am today. And uh, if I, you know, five years ago, I could have never predicted to be here. So I'm really excited to see where where I'll end up in the next five years. I've got a feeling we'll see you on ESPN, the AP, somewhere with one of the big (laughs) wigs, right? And that that would be the dream. Yes, something like that. Well, your dream in athletics started at three years old when you took up basketball and what you said, if you asked me where I would be five years ago, that's a question. I think a lot of us, when we ask that or wonder, Hey, how did we get here? It speaks to the notion of variance and unpredictability and just going along with the flow or as one of my fellow colleagues who's now coaching at Wisconsin River Falls puts it, try to get a little bit better every day instead of thinking about a concrete vision so that you can be open to new experiences. But I'm curious, what were your plans when you took up basketball as an athlete, which you played all the way through high school? Was that something you thought about doing in college or later on? Or what did you have in mind in your time as a burgeoning developing athlete? Yeah. So I feel like growing up, I wanted to play in the WNBA. Like when I was younger, I was like, okay, these like loved Lisa Leslie. I thought the women were awesome. I was like, this would be so fun. Um, Once I got to high school and realized like I was not like the best player or even like top five on my team, I was like, okay, so this probably isn't like a realistic future. Um, And that was when like, you know, WNBA goes out the window and you start just thinking about what your like life dream is going to be after that. But um, I probably could have done like a Juco something for basketball, but like, I just, it wasn't, it wasn't like something that I felt confident in enough to do it after high school. And so, um, yeah, once I got to college, then like, you kind of lose your identity after sports It's obviously way harder for like, um, people who are college athletes. And then after college sports is done, that's a whole different level. But even after high school, I mean, you grow up always having a teammate. Um, like since I was like in parks and rec basketball when I was younger, you're always finding friends and everything through teams. And like, once you are done playing sports, then you don't, that you have to make friends on your own and find other ways to 
um, connect with people. And so I think that was a little bit difficult for me at first. So I got into like intramural basketball and stuff in college, just to stay involved with the sport and meet other people who liked it. So, um, yeah, I think it's difficult, like for girl athletes, like at the time, like in high school, I would have never dreamed. I could have like had the opportunities to work in sports that I do. So it wasn't even something that I thought of or like hoped for. And I like, hoping that like this next generation of young girls who's coming up through like middle school and high school as basketball players realize like they can have a future in sports without playing so that they don't get discouraged if they're not, you know, the top athlete on their team, there's still an opportunity for them to, to stay in this industry and, and be around the sports that they love. So. You mentioned playing in basketball, the idea of always having a teammate with you. And I wanted to follow up on that because one of the avenues that you're involved in, in addition to your new job at Locker Room, is Hoops in Christ, which Kendall Shell, I believe, started and runs it. You know, the two of you have been working together, for lack of a better phrase, over the last few years but you both come from this background of being former athletes. So I imagine the two of you can identify with that transition. It's something a lot of athletes face when they're done, whether they wrap up their careers in high school, college, or the pros, they're so used to their identity being synonymous with the sport they played. How have the two of you navigated that transition together from athletes to, well, people still working with athletes, but what would you say are the difficulties and the joys of discovering a new identity after you made that transition? Yeah. So that's a good question. Kendall and Kendall runs Hoops in Christ with a, another guy named Chauncey Hollingsworth, who was kind of the founder and Kendall and I met when I moved to Minneapolis. Um, and we've been together for about four, four years now. And once I met Kendall and found out about his involvement with Hoops in Christ, it was something I immediately wanted to get involved with just because of the opportunities to kind of give back to like the underserved Minneapolis community. Like they're not, um, working with a bunch of players, like I should say the younger players are ones who are looking for more opportunities and don't have like all the opportunities in the world. They do work with like some NBA players or like they have trained Paige Beckers or other high level high school basketball players who, who do have a lot of opportunities in front of them, but um, working with them and just like, you know, I think it's being a resource for kids. Like when kids, when I was younger, like I remember like older people coming to practices or trainings or whatever. And I just was like in awe of them. I was like, you are so cool. You are so old. Like, I just felt totally intimidated. Like I could have never imagined like using them as a resource or like texting them or having like calls with them about like stuff going on in my life as an athlete in high school at the time. And so I think our involvement with Hoops of Christ, like the joys that come with it are just being there for people and letting them know like, Hey, like we're training you or hosting camps or whatever it is on the court. But just so you know, like we, you can talk to us about off the court stuff too, about um, like what you're it, like, I always say like chase like a purpose instead of an identity, like don't chase an identity, like basketball player chase. Like I want to, you know, like help my family or like have like be happy for life by being a basketball player or something like that. It's not shooting for like a title. It's shooting for like a reason and like a purpose and a passion. And so um, I think just being there as a resource for these kids or younger people or younger athletes is really important. And just letting them know, like, Hey, you can talk about stuff like that doesn't have to do with basketball. Like, you know, like basketball is like something you do, but it's not who you are. Um, and then obviously the difficulties are just every young player, like wants to be in the NBA or the WNBA kind of like I am like, it's kind of letting, like, it's difficult to tell them like, yes, this, this is possible. You can work hard and you can strive for this, but like, just so you know, like you, like, this isn't promised, like, this is a very hard thing to obtain. And I think it's just hard to get it in their heads. Like when they're really young, cause they're like, I I'm, I'm so good. I'm just going to be in the NBA and make millions of dollars. And it seems so easy to be to kids. And so I think just, you know, letting them know that like, yes, like you can work hard and you can have dreams and have goals and that's okay. But like, you need to like, be prepared if, if this doesn't happen, because it's like, it's like winning the lottery. Like, you know, it's, it's, there's not a lot of spots that are out there for you at that point. So, um, yeah, I would say like the biggest joy is just being a resource and letting them know they're more, more than a basketball player and more than an athlete, but, but the difficulties are just like making sure you don't like crush their dreams per se. So and a point that I emphasize multiple times on this podcast, especially for the younger viewers that watch, is this conception that 
you are more than your stats, your points, your win loss record. At some point, fans aren't going to care about the number of titles you won, the number of points you scored. Heck, even I don't know what their career stats are. I have to look it up when I'm interviewing players past and present just to remind myself because that's not what I focus on. Obviously, when I'm prepping for games, I'll look for those trends. But as you're saying, you're going to be so much more than what we see on the court. And I'm glad you and Kendall, through your work with Hoops in Christ and elsewhere, send out that message so that athletes don't get so caught up in the accolades of their sport that they forget to embrace who they are outside of it. Yep, 100%. You went to Northern Iowa, and that is what ignited your passion to get involved in sports media. You referenced an internship that you took with the Washington Wizards. And after that experience, you said you knew you could not find yourself in a situation where you weren't covering sports. What led you to that internship and how did that spark this journey? Yeah, so uh, I was in college and it was my junior year, I believe. And I got a job with John Deere, which is very Iowa of me. And um, I was an administrative assistant and it was basically, it was a good program to be at. Like you made decent money and got some money for school and stuff like that. And so um, I started working full time in the summer before my senior year. I was like in the like actual nine to five, five days a week thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is miserable. I get home from work and I'm so tired. I can't cook dinner. Like, how am I going to do this for the rest of my life? And I just like at work, I just felt bored. Like I wasn't happy there. And so I was like, okay, like you need to start thinking about like, what will like fulfill you? What is like, if you're going to work a nine to five, like think of what you'd have like enjoyment doing. And so um, that was when I found teamworkonline.com, which basically just hosts a bunch of sports jobs. And, um, I literally applied for everything that I, that I thought that I could do. And there was probably a lot of it I couldn't do, but I applied for probably, I don't even know, probably around 50 to 70 jobs, like throughout the summer. And literally at the end of August, um, I got an internship with the Redskins at the time, the Washington football team. And now, and then, um, the wizards and, uh, somehow, some way the wizards decided to hire me with no sports experience or, um, really no background in, in sports at all, just outside of me playing them. And so, uh, it was literally the very end of the summer. It was like mid August that I got offered and I had to move to DC in two weeks and, and take that internship. And so, uh, yeah, once I got there, I was like, okay, like this is a nine to five. It was actually more than a nine to five. It was like a nine to five plus all home games and stuff and set up and tear down. But um, I was like, this is fun. Like, I like the people, I like the atmosphere. I like the work that I'm doing. Like it was just a total 180. And that was when I was like, you know, I was event, I was an event planning there. So I wasn't like a media person covering the wizards, but I was very, very close to like the players, like in regards to like events and stuff like that. And so I was like, okay, this is, this is super fun. Like, this is something I could see myself doing like, you know, five days a week. And, um, so that was really what kind of sparked my interest in sports is when I realized that I had to find something that I liked if I was going to dedicate that much time to it. And sports was just a no brainer for me growing up as a sports fan and athlete. You mentioned Lisa Leslie early on as one of your role models. Was that the person you looked up to the most or were there other athletes as you were making your way through the ranks as an athlete and then as a fan of athletes? Yeah, I always like Lisa Leslie from a women's side and then like later would be like Diana Taurasi and super um, obviously greatness and then Maya Moore as well just being with the Lynx um, and then I always looked up to Kobe when I was younger. So that was obviously hard last year losing him. Like he was just, I feel like every little kid's like idol when it came to the NBA. And so that was another person um, outside of that. Like once I kind of started moving through the ranks, I started noticing a lot more women in sports media and like out, outside of athletes. So like Doris Burke or like Taylor Rooks with Bleacher Report um, or Malika Andrews or Cassidy Hubbard, like once I actually really started getting honestly immersed into like NBA and WNBA Twitter, that was when like, I really started realizing like, oh, like there, you know, I don't have to just look up to women athletes. There's a lot of women that are in sports that I can look up to too. So like Holly Rowe and, and other women come to mind. And so, 
um, yeah, I would say it like started as young, like just wanting to be like one of the tall, awesome WNBA like athletes. And then as I, as I got into like working in sports more, it definitely transitioned into like getting inspired by, by fellow women in the industry. I'm wondering in your work, have you had any opportunities to meet up with some of these idols of yours? <sighs> None of the women that I just named off um, through like the wizards. Like I met Mark Cuban, who was just like a business idol, which I thought was awesome. Um, uh, I did, I did meet Holly Rowe briefly at a gopher football game that she was covering uh, when they upset. I can't think of who it was now. Um, Penn State. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. She was, she was covering that game. So I got to talk to her briefly there. Um, but that was like me as a fan, that was me not covering, like not covering the game, but um, like I've worked with Kristen Peake who works for Yahoo sports and she covers like high school college recruiting and then like some MBA stuff. And, and I just love her and adore her. And so I feel like I have a lot of women in sports on my checklist that are either like media personalities or just on Twitter, like you talked about Ari Chambers. Um, just like, I am like dying to meet her in person just because we are like Twitter friends. So um, yeah, I feel like COVID put everything on pause as I started getting closer to these people and working on projects with like bigger brands and organizations. But hopefully once it kind of starts getting back to normal, I'll get to meet these, these awesome women and people in the industry. If it makes you feel any better, Brie, I'm dying to meet Ari again. I got to work with her at the 2018 All-Star Game because she wanted to add some more clips to her reel. And you may have seen my work. I'm just as comfortable shooting video as I am being in front of it. I don't care if I'm in front of the camera all the time. I just don't see myself <laughs> as having to be the star in order to tell the story. And... Who knows, you know, maybe there's still time. Maybe you can get a spot on the Forbes 30 under 30 list for next year. I would love that, but Ari totally deserved it. I was so happy for her, but yes, that that is a goal for sure. Well, Ari, if you're watching this, maybe you can put in a reference for next year. Thanks, Ari. <laughs> <laughs> so you go from the Wizards, you get your degree from Northern Iowa, you then start your sports media career in sports engine and from there it has taken you so many places i've watched you conduct interviews on the nike eybl circuit we all know about your photography work in particular page backers and several other athletes have shared your photos on their social media and recently you started selling uh, prints of your work as a way to kill time <laughs> I have to say, Brie, that pretty clever move that just going out and grabbing photos of still basketball environments just to pass the time has turned into a side hustle for you. But, you know, I talk about doing everything. You've done the same thing, shooting games, conducting interviews. I don't know if there's anything you haven't done, but take us from the start at Sports Engine. How did that lead to this ongoing branch of networking opportunities? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, so when I started at Sports Engine, I was a part-time intern. So I was working at Sports Engine from like 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then I was going to work as a part-time um, receptionist as a massage place from like two to like 9 p.m. So I was working like 12 hour days for the first three or four months that I was here. And um, I think it was, you know, after I started at Sports Engine, I was part time, I was putting in stats and kind of doing like website and Twitter stuff. And I was like, this is not like what I want to do exactly. Like it was a lot of manual data entry stuff that I knew that I was not very passionate about. And so um, we had a Twitter presence, but I was like, we are keep we keep borrowing other people's photos and having to give photo credit. And like we have no graphics or any kind of like visual online presence, um, like from a creative standpoint. And so I had a little bit of work in like Photoshop and stuff in college. And so I had a little bit of background on design and just kind of started learning like photography and camera and, and all that kind of work on YouTube. And uh, from there on, I started going to the Nike UIBL events because basically when I came in, I worked on D1 circuit, which was like 
ESPN to NBA, we were to the Nike EYBL. So we would just covered only that league. And so it was very heavy in the summer. And then kind of the off season was a lot lighter about around like people committing to colleges, but like I got totally immersed in what high school basketball was. I had no idea that like Nike and all these shoe brands put so much money behind it. And that were, there were these huge like athletes that had like hundreds of thousands of followers on, on Instagram. Like I was like, okay, I was like in high school, like at that point, like four or five years ago, like things have elevated since then. Like the world of social media just completely elevated high school hoops. And I just fell in love with it and like covering it and being at the events and being able to tell the stories of these athletes who like some of them didn't need the exposure, but some of them really did. Um, and so that was really what got me into the media space and the creative space was like seeing a gap in the coverage that I was working on and like basically teaching myself things to fill those gaps. So um, I never had wanted to like be a reporter and interview athletes, but I learned how to do that and got the kind of in front of the camera, which I've done a lot less of now because I'm more of a behind the camera person now. Um, but I I'm willing to do both and I'm fine having those conversations with, with people in the industry. So yeah, it really just started with, with filling gaps. And then I really just fell in love with like social media coverage and all types of things being creative in the sports industry and really just expanded on it and kind of started to build my network on social media. Like for the first year of doing photography, I was kind of hiding behind like the D1 circuit brand. Nobody knew that like I was taking the photos and I wasn't really showing them off on my personal accounts or anything. And so I created like a photo Instagram account and then people started recognizing me and as a photographer and stuff like that, which was one of the smartest things that I did because, you know, it got my name out there and, and people started recognizing my work or like, do you, like Dwayne Wade reposted some of my photos sometime and stuff like that. Like it just, it really helped out my personal brand, which like created just a lot of really awesome connections in the industry that, um, have really like gotten me the opportunities I have. I mean, like, uh, I met a girl named Meredith Minko, who probably everybody knows on Twitter and, um, her and I just, uh, like we had always supported each other on Twitter. And then I actually met her at the WNBA all-star weekend. And, um, we talked very briefly, not for very long, but I finally got to meet her in person. And then she recommended me to Bleacher Report to do like a USA basketball shoot that I wasn't able to do that was in Minneapolis. And then like, once I had that connection with Bleacher Report, then I got set up with them to shoot Chet and Paige in Minnesota. So like, really it's, it's my connections and networking and just like, being, you know, connected to this sports industry that is actually very small. Once you get in it, you realize how, how small of a world it is that has just led me to the awesome opportunities that I've had today. So thankfully. I have joked with parents and coaches and some players that when it comes to basketball, it feels like I'm destined to meet with all of them. When you mention the players you've covered. And as I became familiar with your work, and now I understand how you got the opportunity to shoot Hopkins and mini haha games. It was through Bleacher Report, which is, hey, that's not a bad thing. And Paige was the first high school athlete to be featured, or the first female high school athlete to get a cover on Slam Magazine. So you know, I could see your work there someday if it hasn't been published there already. But I'm curious, when athletes like Dwayne Wade and Paige Beckers, Chet Holmgren, they're familiar with your work, when they shared or retweeted, I don't know if they tag you or not, but how much does your phone blow up when high profile athletes like them promote the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, a lot. So an example would be LeBron actually posted two of my photos in the summer of 2019 of him and Bronny, um, like walking off the court, like he had his hand over him and LeBron didn't tag me. He still hasn't tagged me to this day. You know, I'm a little salty about it, but we'll, we'll skip over that. Um, and like, I literally had like everybody in my photo community, like tagging me in the comments, like give her photo credit, tag her, like, like that kind of stuff. And like that support is so awesome. And then like, I think I'm almost positive the same thing happened with Dwayne Wade, except I just had my watermark on it, but he still didn't tag me. So it was kind of the same thing. Like everybody was like, Hey, like, um, uh, tag her in this, give her photo credit. And it's just awesome to have that support. And then like, uh, Gabrielle union, who was with Dwayne Wade at one of the Nike UIBL events, like quote tweeted something that I had on Twitter and I'll have like random people that I haven't talked to in like eight years reach out to me and be like, yo, like, this is crazy. You got retweeted by Gabrielle Union. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, it's crazy to me too. Like, it doesn't even feel like, like 
it just feels, I don't even know. It doesn't feel like real at the time. I just have to like, be like, oh, well, that's pretty crazy, but okay. Um, and so I feel like my phone, like it, it gets blown up, but like, especially Paige, like literally if Paige will like reshare a story that I tag her in, I just get like all of these Paige fan accounts and like high school, like her engagement and fan base is on like, like it doesn't even compare to the guys that I've covered. Like Paige is on her own island with her own like just insane fan base that loves her and engages with her content so much. I'm like, she, she doesn't post that much, like physically like pictures on the feed, but if she did, I just can't, I just can't imagine how like more big she would be right now. Cause she has like 650 K followers without trying very hard on Instagram. Like if she actually tried, I, she'd be in the millions. The people love her. So um, yeah, she's probably, my phone probably blows the most up like on Instagram after she reposts stuff, but um, yeah, I'm still waiting for the day that LeBron tags me. That would be nice. <laughs> Couple of follow-up points to that. I imagine that's why you started using watermarks in case an athlete shares your work and it happens if they don't know where you got it from. And there could be any yep. number of reasons. So I can understand yep. why you'd feel salty, but when you're LeBron James and Dwayne Way, you know, you might not have a whole lot of time to sift through, <laughs> totally <laughs> sift through the finer details. The other question I had, do you have to keep a portable battery with you in case your phone blows up and runs your battery dry? So you have a portable battery you can just hook the USB up to? Yeah, I would say I don't have to necessarily charge it just in fear of it blowing up. It's even, it's just more so like I am constantly on my phone, whether it's like recording, like at all the Nike UIBL events, I was a photographer, but I also ran the Instagram and was having to like take videos of every matchup and like do polls on who would win and do pregame stuff. And so like, yes, I, for, I always have to have a portable charger in a perfect world. I would have two phones, but I'm not that privileged yet. <laughs> One day. Yeah. One day, <laughs> one day, one day you'll get a following as big as page and then you can start your career as an influencer. Oh boy. Monetize your accounts and you'll never have to work a nine to five again. Hey, well, Hey, that, that'd be, that'd be really nice. Let's manifest that. <laughs> I'm hoping for that myself. <laughs> Not because I don't want to work, but I just have so much fun covering sports and Same. that's what I'm trying yeah. to do is build up a self-sustaining model so that I can focus exclusively on that. Yep. Curious, Bree, how would you assess your learning curve? You spoke of having to learn interviewing skills and Photoshop editing on your own. You had some knowledge, but most of this wasn't required. This was just you absorbing all this information through experience. What would you make of the learning curve and what do you think is the toughest part about embarking on interviews, photography, all of that, since you have done it all? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a tough learning curve because you don't know what you don't know. So you it, like starting is extremely hard just because there's so much information out there. So if you're starting as like a complete beginner and you're trying to figure out like, which uh, Adobe like platform is going to be best for the designs that I want to do? Like that's hard enough to figure out or what lenses or what camera should I get? Like that's in the price range that I can afford. And so um, I think having somebody, if you can find someone, like if you want to be in photography, find a photographer, even if they're a newer one, like it doesn't need to be like, like the photographer you want to be when you grow up. Like if you can just find someone who's starting out or a beginner, or like if there's a designer who knows Photoshop and like finding a mentor to help you like navigate, like they don't have to give you all the answers and walk you through how to do stuff, but if they can at least tell you what kind of things you should be looking for and like what kind of stuff you should be working on as a beginner, I think that's just extremely helpful. Like luckily me being at sports engine, like when I started, it was probably like 150 people. And we had like a design team and there was some people at sports engine who were photographers. So like, if I had any questions before, like making a purchase on a camera or something, I was able to go to them. Um, and I think that makes a big difference because like, you just can't trust every article out there and every, all the information that you find on the internet. And it's hard to like, really make it tailored to what you want to do. And so finding somebody like it does not have to be somebody who's amazing, but just somebody who knows the basics, um, I think is really important. And then 
Um, from there is just practicing, like practice designing, practice photographing. It doesn't always have to be at like the highest level high school games, like go out and capture like street pickup ball or go out and like design stuff for friends who have like side hustles or something and just practice because like, you're never going to get better if you don't just sit around and keep trying. Like that was, I just like, my first stuff was so bad. My first photos, my first designs, like they are cringeworthy, cringeworthy to look back at now, but um, I didn't stop. Like I, I, I wasn't afraid of like, you know, people like looking at my stuff, thinking it was super bad. Cause I just knew I was a beginner and I knew that I was going to get better. And so I kept going and I kept sharing my work and like, you can literally like scroll through my photo Instagram and like, just see the improvement from when I started, because it was just, it was rough, but the more that you practice, the more that you learn and like understand what stuff you should be looking for, um, when it comes to design or photography or social media management and, um, I would just, yeah, advise you to stick with it. Like there's going to be times where like, oh my gosh, this person is so much better than me. I can never even compete with them. And they're in the same industry, but like everybody, like most people want to see other people win and help them. You know, it's not, some people are out there for the competition and they want to be the best, but a lot of people just want to help other people who were in the same shoes that they were. Like, that's how I look at it. If somebody reaches out to me and asks like what kind of lenses I use or something like that. Like I always try to respond and get back to them because I remember being that person um, and like not knowing, you know, what to do or, or um, what stuff to get. So I think it's just all about not being afraid to ask questions, uh, at least at the beginning. And something I learned, I did some photography a few years ago in my writing career, especially at Gophers games or other events where I was the only person on site. So I would shoot photos for a half and then spend the second half just focusing on the game so I could think about what I wanted to write. One thing I learned from doing that, even though I haven't done photography as of late, is how many opportunities you get. I'm sure you're always going for that perfect picture. And thankfully, because of the nature of basketball and other sporting events, you realize over time that if it didn't work on the last play, there's a good chance you can get the shot you're looking for on the next play. So it can add up. And I would shoot in burst mode in case someone would drive and go for a layup or a three-point shot something where you give yourself a little bit of buffer. Now, I don't know how you approach it. And personally, I think there's more than one way to approach shooting a sporting event. But when you realize that, hey, if I messed up on this play, I can try again on the next one. I think that's what helps you become at ease with learning and growing through experience. Definitely. Yes. I was the same way. Like I I honestly still take way too many pictures at games. Like I, like I would get done with a day of Nike EYBL shooting from like 8 AM to like 9 PM. And I would have like 12,000 photos to go through. And I'm like, this is putting so much work on me after, but like, I'm just so, I just, I just don't want to miss anything because I have missed moments and I like still regret them to this day. Like when I will like get a cool dunk shot and then like put the camera down and then they have an awesome after reaction or something like that. And so, um, Yes, I shoot on high high speed continuous and have like my camera has 10 frames per second. So I get a bunch of shots, especially on like plays like that when somebody's dunking or going up for like a Euro step layup or something like that. Um, but it's yes, it's a total learning experience because you start out shooting and like if you're like me, you have a crappy camera that doesn't take photos very fast and the lighting is bad and like you, you just don't like you, there is a bet, there is like a better horizon in sight is, is how I would advise it because you start out and you just don't have all of the resources and the money and stuff to camera equipment is expensive. And so beginners can easily get discouraged because they're not seeing, you know, what they see on Instagram and stuff, but the more that you try and, and experiment with it, the better you're going to get. It may not be long before we have all of that processing power on our phones. No doubt. I, there's going to be a day. <laughs> I guess that is one perk since I do mostly video, you may have seen my broadcast work, even if you haven't. The downside is the files are really, really large because I shoot at 60 frames per second to create that broadcast field that you see on ESPN. The plus side is I don't have 12,000 files to go through. <laughs> yep. Concentrated in larger chunks, but all of us coming together to tell these stories, that is what makes this community so tight knit and powerful 
as far as promoting the stories and the identities of these athletes. Bree, I'm curious, even though interviewing isn't your forte in the sense that's what you do most frequently, were there any athletes or personalities that you had the chance to interview that you look back on and you were excited to have that opportunity? Yeah, oh man, there's a lot. Um, I would say probably my favorites were Colin Sexton, just because he was a total savage in high school and I loved watching him on the court. And um, I think like the interview that I did with him for Sports Engine is like probably my most watched one um, because he was just, everybody loved him. Like he was just a huge star in high school, even before, like I remember him staring down Penny Hardaway in a game, um, he was a savage. And so he was, he was really fun. Trey Jones is always a delight. That kid is just, so kind and so he he was just like the easiest person to interview he's always smiling he's always nice um i so i always really liked talking to trey and then probably um when i interviewed at the final four i got to talk to a few of those athletes um which was like the most nerve-wracking thing ever because like i felt like i had always been around high school athletes and so then you know getting to like the college stage where they're much more used to media. And like, if you mess up, it's going to be way more obvious than it would to a high schooler. Um, I was, I was very nervous there, but that was a cool experience. Um, and then Marvin Bagley and like Michael Porter Jr. were, were two other good ones that, that were really fun to like fun to talk to that were just like people, you know, that you knew were going to be in the NBA and be in the league and, and we're kind of just waiting on the day for that to happen. And so those are probably like the top names that I could think of off my head, but I, I still wish that I got more chance to do, I, we didn't cover Nike girls EYBL. So I never had the opportunity to go to those events and like talk to the high school players, but that's kind of my goal for the future is to get out to those ones and, and talk to girls. Cause it's just way easier for me. Like, I just like, I form better relationships with women players and they're just easier to talk to, um, obviously being a woman. So, um, I'm excited for that day someday. Bree, I'm not a woman and I have found it <laughs> easier <laughs> to approach female athletes. And that's not to say that male athletes aren't intelligent or articulate or any of that. Totally. Yep. But I think they're aware of all the social media hype that surrounds them, whether it's Jalen Suggs, Chet Holmgren, who I have high respect for. Even when Jalen gets a technical, and I remember covering a game last year where my commentator was throwing a little shade. I didn't know about that. And it's one of those things where, okay, I can't control what she says. You just roll with it. So yep. you'll never see me chastise or antagonize someone because I disagree with what they say. But I always look at it from the perspective of let's learn as much about these players as you can. Uh, Trey Jones is another one who is now in the NBA. And I know before we started, you mentioned uh, LeBron, his son, Bronny Wade, Dwayne Wade, of course, has his son, Zaire. And those two, you almost feel for them because they have so much pressure simply because of who their dads are. And yeah. in this hot take culture that permeates so many men's sports, you can understand why it can be a little more difficult because these athletes have to figure out, you know, what's your deal? What are you trying to get out of this? I had a future guests with this podcast asked me that. And I just said, to be honest, I'm passionate about sports and storytelling. Like I'm not looking for anything that I don't deserve. Yep. If, it, if something leads to a big break, great. <laughs> Hopefully it's because I earned it. If not, you know, that's okay too. I think you and I have this understanding that working in sports, we're often going to give more than we receive, but we're okay with that because we get the opportunity to provide a snapshot in time for these up and coming athletes. On the photography side, I will not ask you what your favorite event is or favorite team or any of that, because you've covered so many that it would be impossible, I think, for you to list a number one experience. But what would you say you have gained out of chances to cover the WNBA All-Star Game or to follow Jalen Suggs, Chet Holmgren for the Minnehaha Academy boys team and Paige Beckers and all of the D1 athletes for the Hopkins girls basketball team? You've been a witness to this next generation of athletes we are going to hear about. And as you said earlier, you can gain memories, experiences, and networking from other games. It doesn't have to be Hopkins all the time, but 
what would you say your experience going out and shooting games for Bleacher Report and whoever else uh, calls you up and says, hey, uh, can you come shoot for us? What do you gain from those moments? Yeah, I would say, first of all, I gain experience. Like when I did the WNBA All-Star and was working with the NBA and WNBA, like I was literally taking photos and then running over and like delivering my memory card for them to upload my pictures to Getty. And like my pictures are on Getty now, which is like so crazy to me, like being someone who is familiar with Getty. Um, but like I that was a grind. Like that was, that was a day where I was like, okay, I've kind of been, you know, doing my own thing at the Nike EYBL events because I was, you know, I was working for someone, but it wasn't the NBA WNBA. It was a very small media outlet. And then, um, I feel like I, you know, just learned how to like do like be a photographer, learn processes, um, kind of like be with the people that I look up to and work alongside them. And so I feel like, I just gained really helpful experience and, and then awesome relationships, you know, like I would meet people out of the Hopkins games who would come up and say hi and that they love my work. And then I would learn about them. Like the guy who photographs for D'Angelo Russell came up at a Hopkins game last year when D Russell and um, Kat and uh, James Johnson came to pages game and he introduced himself. And now I have a connection with him as a creative in the industry. And so it's really just like experiences and relationships I've gained from all of these events. And I think the relationships are the most important part because those are what turn into more experiences and then more experiences turn into more relationships. So it's kind of like full circle. <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the players you've developed relationships with uh, from Kendall to Rachel Bannum to Paige and Jalen and all these others. And I'm going, if there's ever like a party whenever it's safe again to celebrate your new job or some milestone achievement, uh, you're going to need some space. You might have to call and make some reservations, Brie. Oh man. Yeah. I can't even imagine being at a party right now in a, in a pandemic. So we'll, we'll think about that when, when life is back to normal, but yeah, at the very least it'd be a, it'd be a pop in zoom party. <laughs> I was going to say, whenever it's safe to do in-person gatherings, you might have to start an autograph line because I think a lot of folks would want to have their, their your print signed or something like that. Oh, boy. <laughs> if you don't mind, what would you make of the relationships you've built? Obviously, you and Kendall have become quite the one-two tandem, and you speak fondly of Rachel Bannum, who is now playing for the Minnesota Lynx and following the same path professionally that Lindsey Wayland did, starting at Connecticut, and then working away back home, but also getting to know the Beckers family, the Suggs family, Holmgren, all of them, they remember you for taking snapshots of their time in athletics that we're going to look back on whenever documentaries or retrospectives or when networks do a look back. There's a chance that your work could end up in those montages but to have that opportunity to befriend so many people in athletics, even though you weren't able to continue that yourself as a professional athlete, what does that mean for you? It means a lot uh, because I know as an athlete, it's hard to like trust people. And, you know, you never really know if somebody is covering you for the right reason. Um, and if like, you know, they're genuine and they want to actually get to know you and care about you, or if they're just trying to you know, have a headline or get more followers on social media by covering them or whatever. And so I feel very lucky that these people have trusted me to tell their stories and um, do it in like a genuine and authentic way that shows, you know, I, I care about you as like a person and not just as an athlete or somebody who can benefit me and my job. Like I always want to try to bring value to them as well, because they are like, frankly, bringing value to me. So um, like with Paige, like I check in on her, you know, all the time, like when her ankle was hurt or after big games or tough losses or when her games were getting canceled from COVID, because that's all stuff that impacts her emotionally and mentally and not just, you know, on the court as a basketball player. And so while I'm telling those stories of these people as an athlete, mostly, you know, I, with Rachel, I've done like some off court photos and stuff like that. And obviously hang out with her outside of um, basketball, but um, just letting them know that like, I care about them as a person and as somebody who I like value and look up to and, and inspired by even as somebody like, even after their athletic days are over. Um, and so I think that's the exciting part about making these relationships is, is just being trusted number one by like their families, because, you know, as kids, like 
as a high school, you're pretty much going to trust anyone. And especially if they're with like a big media outlet or something like you would have no reason not to trust people, but parents are always much more wary of who their kids are around for all the right reasons, completely justifiable. Um, and so, you know, like being close with Paige's mom and, and meeting her dad and Chet's dad and everything has been, has been really great. And I feel, you know, honored that they trust me to tell their stories because a lot of these athletes are getting bombarded by a lot of media people. And, you know, they certainly don't need more attention, most of them. So, um, I feel lucky to be like trusted as, as somebody who is there for the right reasons. And if I may add to that, Bree, the way I look at covering sports and interviewing athletes. I'm just looking to share their story. If I gain more followers out of it, great, but that's not why I do it. And something I've learned is that you can't force these relationships. You have to let them saturate and marinate and grow organically over time. And you have to stay persistent too. And that means going beyond liking and retweeting. Now that's a good way to start. That's actually how I found you. I'm not sure who shared your work, but I just remember going, hey, she's at a lot of the games that I cover or we cover the same beat. So I'm thinking this is somebody I'm gonna have to pay attention to. And I'm glad I have because I've gotten to learn a lot about you and how you came from this small town in Iowa. I don't know what visions they have out of citizens from Mason City, but to go from a state with no pro sports and to take a chance to see what you have created for yourself in the last five years is remarkable. Thank you. And, and, and I mean that truly, it's not trying to butter you up. It's like, no, it's like, okay, how, how many folks can say they got to shoot in the WNBA all-star game to have photo credits under the Getty Images database? You know, that's something a lot of photographers would love to have on the resume. You get to say that authentically. And I take that same approach with athletes, whether it's interviewing Paige Beckers or interviewing players from teams that don't get covered all the time. There were some athletes who told me that they were thrilled that I didn't cover them as much. Uh, Nia Holly comes to mind there. And not because she wasn't a good athlete. She and I are great friends, but she said, you know, if you covered my games more often, that would have taken you away from covering athletes who didn't get as much press time. Love that. Because, well, Paige Beckers and Jalen Suggs come to mind. Totally. We couldn't get enough of them. Mini Haha got two games on ESPN. Paige Beckers gets on Slam. And everywhere they went, you would see at least three or four photographers kind of going back to what you're saying. Everybody wants to cash in on the Paige Beckers and Jalen Suggs freight train. And I get why if you're overtime, if you're slam or bleacher report, those are the names that will attract the audience. But there are a lot of stories out there that you can find by exploring the rest of the state. I've often joked that my biggest regret each year is that I don't cover more teams. And this is coming from a guy who covers 50 games at least every winter for high school basketball. So I, I probably shouldn't be complaining about <laughs> if I, am I covering enough teams, but <laughs> I've learned so much about these athletes, whether they go D one and have professional aspirations, Paige and Jalen, I'm sure will have lengthy careers, but there are a lot of stories to be told outside of them. Yes. And it's important, I think to, let those athletes know that they're valued too. I can only imagine you spoke of not being the star athlete on your team. You know, you're comfortable with who you are, but maybe there was a point in time where you had some inferiority complex brewing about not being the star and all the attention that comes with it. But you have been able to forge your own story over time. And even if you weren't the star athlete on your team, you found a way to make it work. Totally. Yeah. I, we had a girl named Jada Buckley who ended up playing for Iowa state. That was just absolutely amazing on our team. And, um, she was like the person who got all of the attention in high school. And I was, I I'm just a competitive person. I'm not necessarily attention seeking, but like, especially when it comes to sports, I'm like, Oh, like, why can't I be the best? Like I'm trying hard. Like, why am I not like being, you know? And so I think I struggled with that, but like, 
you know, once I got out of high school and wasn't an athlete anymore, and then I started doing it in reels, I was like, I just love this game. Like, I just love the connections that you get brought by like playing basketball, like whether it's with teammates or other people in the industry. And like, I truly feel now that even though I'm not on a sports team or an athlete anymore, I feel like I still have this team in the sports industry, whether it's just like women who are supporting other women, or if it's people like you who are just supporting other people in media and people who cover the sports that they do. But like, you really get to create like your own sports community, even when you're not an athlete. But, and I think that's what's so special is like, you get to tell these stories and, you know, help cultivate communities with teams and players and like, uh, like you with the state of Minnesota and women's hoops, but like you also, um, get to like meet other people and, and find out more stories like, like you are with me and find out how people got to where they did and then create, you know, like lasting relationships and friendships in the industry. And so I feel like there are still ways to, to build communities within sports without being athletes. And I think that's, that's one of the coolest parts of the sports industry. And that's why I keep coming back. Even when I thought, when I decided to take a hiatus from the WNBA, I'm thinking maybe my writing days are behind me those relationships, they don't go away. So I'm learning this the hard way. Just when you think you're gone for good, someone's <laughs> going to rope you back in and get you started all over again. And I'm okay with that. Sure. It's hard to say no, <laughs> <laughs> especially in sports. You touched on this, but in case people are looking for maybe the cliff notes or a quick tip or guideline, there's more than one way to do it the right way, but based on your experience, What are some tips, some advice you would give when it comes to covering athletes, either through your work in photography or interviewing so that athletes, especially those at the high school level, get the sense that you're there to build everyone up. As you stated for both of us, we do this because we want everyone to win. We're just happy to have it seat the table. You know, we're not looking at this as a way to build ourselves up at the expense of these athletes but it can be daunting. I've told kids all the time, it's not easy to do interviews with a microphone in front of your face, in front of a camera. High school athletes aren't necessarily trained for that, but most of them do a great job. And I always tell them it's a conversation, not a test, but from your background, your experience, what is some advice you would offer to people if they're looking to shoot a game, do interviews and start fostering the relationships the way you and I have? Yeah, for sure. Um, That's a great question. And I think you touched on it a little bit and you said, don't force it. And I think that's one of the most important parts. Um, So when I started like building relationships with athletes, it was, uh, it was when I worked for D1 Circuit, the Nike UIBL coverage, and I just went through them to meet athletes. Like I ha- would have a list that like we would give to Nike UIBL that I would want to come interview and then like post on YouTube and stuff. And so I used D1 Circuit to talk to these kids. I never reached out to these kids directly saying like, hey, I want to photograph you or like, um, hey, like uh, let's do an interview today so I can post it on my personal channel. Like it was all through the media outlet, which was like, the media outlet is a clear sign that they're like covering these kids for the right reasons. Like a media outlet, like you've touched on like slam or bleach report. That's like, that's like a trust. Like they, they know that they're not taking advantage of them. Like they, they're highlighting their stories. And like, I didn't want anyone to think that I was using the athletes for my personal brand or personal gain. I just wanted to tell their stories and cover these things for, for a D1 circuit. And so that was kind of how I started to build the athlete relationships. And I would be, you know, posting on D1 circuit and then people would message D1 circuit and they'd be like, Hey, where do I get these photos? Like send me the photos so I can post them on my Instagram. And then I would be like, Hey, like my name is Bree, like here's the Dropbox link or whatever it is. And then like, they would start reaching out to me individually. Like, Hey, Bree, did you get any pictures today? And like literally building them like very organically and naturally, like it was never me reaching out to the players, trying to do photo shoots with them or trying to do interviews with them for my personal brand. It was all just very natural and organic, like even with Paige. So I started just wanting to go out and shoot some Hopkins games. Cause I heard this team was awesome. And I had never really been immersed in like high school girls hoops. And so, um, I didn't even try to talk to Paige. I didn't even like try to build a relationship with her because I knew that she was already getting completely like overwhelmed. And she was already famous by the time that I was like starting to get into, get into Hopkins. And then like Bleacher Report, 
um, asked me if I would do a shoot with her, like just because they had me in like their database of Minneapolis photographers. Um, and they were going to do a feature on her and I had already worked with them for the Chet feature. And so I think like after, you know, the Chet one, they were like, okay, we're, we're going to hire her again. And so that was my first time ever meeting Paige. After, even though I had known her, I had watched her, I had known how much of a star she was. I never tried to reach out before that to like meet her. I just, I'm not like a, a big, like fan person. Like I want to like naturally build and organically build relationships. And so then after we worked together that day, we meshed so well together. Like she is just like anybody who met, meets her knows how awesome she is. She's so humble. She's so easy to talk to. Um, she's super funny and we just meshed super well. And like literally after that point, I went out to every one of her games. I was talking to her a lot more. We were texting, we were becoming friends and that like eventually led like right before she went to UConn this year, we did a shoot with all of her like McDonald's all American slam high school, like all of her jerseys and stuff. And that was like a personal thing. And so like, I, again, it's just building up relationships organically, like whether it's through media outlets, like that would be my advice is like, start with a media outlet, even if it's a, even if it's a small one, because if you're reaching out to people by yourself as a photographer or an interviewer and trying to get to talk to someone just because it's for your personal brand, that athlete is going to think you're using them to like gain popularity in the space. Like maybe not everyone, some athletes want that coverage. Um, but if you're going for like the high profile athletes that you brought up, like Jalen or, or Paige, um, um, they, they're going to, they're probably not going to think you have like the most, like the highest intentions because they already have that coverage. So why, why would they need more of it? It, it almost looks like it's something for you. So, um, let those relationships build organically, but then, you know, do offer up your coverage to like the lower level ones. Like you don't always have to, if you're just starting out, you don't always have to hope to get like the best athletes with the most popularity and social media followers. Like you're a great example of, of telling like finding stories with lower level athletes and smaller schools and people who don't get as much coverage because there are stories to be told there. They're just not being told. And, um, that's just another way is to build up a relationship with maybe a smaller school and then they get a star athlete in a couple of years. And then you're covering the star athlete because you built the relationship with that team and that school before, you know, it was popular. And so, um, just be, just be genuine about it and, and let it happen organically. Don't force it and make sure your intentions are right. Like really think about like, why do I want to build a relationship with this athlete? Or why do I want to build a relationship? Relationship with this team or the school. And if it's really just to serve you, then I would like, I would just advise to rethink that and find out how you can serve them while they also serve you. Like it's, it, you want everybody to win. It's a win-win situation. Absolutely. Although I have an amusing anecdote Oh boy. that, well, it, it somewhat goes against what you're saying, but I think it will make sense. Like this podcast series and the games that I produce for years, I would share them on my YouTube channel, but I never looked at it as this is just my personal channel. I market right. it as if it were a media entity. And over the last few years, I've worked out arrangements with the local television stations, the cable stations like CCX for Hopkins and CTV, if I'm covering like Concordia or Roseville, uh, just looking at ways I can bolster my requests or bolster myself when I reach out to athletic directors, since I am building my own brand. And I was amazed at the number of stations that said, yeah, send your stuff. We'll be happy to air it. Because if you think about it, they're looking for programming and you can help give them extra hours of programming. And especially for stations like CCX who have multiple schools in their umbrella, in their coverage zone, they can't get to every game that they would want to. Totally. So you get to fill in the gaps and give them some extra games that, you know, whether or not they use it on their broadcast, that's fine, but it gives me another olive branch. But over time, I've been amazed at the number of interviews I've been able to line up just with my YouTube channel being the primary distributor. It helps that I have over 10,000 subscribers, but I put in the work to get there. And when I hit 10,000, yes, I did a podcast and I did a couple of celebratory things because it's a big number and it's a big deal, even though I don't think it is. <laughs> when it goes back to the inferiority thing, because I look at the accounts that have hundreds of thousands, like CCX, I'm going, well, this is big, but they're bigger. And I want, I want to aim higher. I, I'm not very good at settling. <laughs> That is one of my weaknesses. Like hey, that's, I never, not, that's not bad. That's no, not a bad thing. <laughs> no, but I, I sometimes you forget to appreciate the milestones you do reach because you're always striving for more. Totally. But I, I use the same philosophy that you spoke of. Yes, 
a lot of these podcasts and games are going on my channel, but I'm doing it so that my audience can get a glimpse, a window into the stories and talents of athletes and coaches who are part of this, totally. this podcast series. I look at it as an oral history documentation. It doesn't get the viewership that my games do, but I'm okay with that. But it all goes back to like, you know what? Yeah, you're doing a pretty good job building up your own platform. Like people know they recognize the name and all of that. So it's kind of funny when you speak of hooking up with outlets and that certainly helps because it does create that impression, that message that, hey, this is why I'm here. But over time, I guess my point as long-winded as it was, is that perhaps for someone like yourself, Bree, you could reach a point where you don't necessarily have to align yourself with a media outlet. Not that you would turn down a chance to work for Bleacher Report or Slam or any of them, but if they don't have any openings and you have a game or a story you want to shoot, you're building up a lot of positive deposits in that bank to the point where I don't think you'd have any trouble once we get past the pandemic, finding opportunities on your own accord. Totally. And I think that's that's the goal. I mean, you look at somebody like Cassie Athena, who's a photographer who has literally never worked for media brands. She's been under her own name and she takes pictures of like the highest profile NBA players um, that exist. And she has had trouble getting into Nike UIBL events because they want media outlets only. They don't want personal brands there because then everybody with a personal brand would apply and try to get into Peach Jam. And, and so it's tough, but she's navigated the space and she's created her own like media brand with her own name and like similar to you are doing, which I think is awesome. I just think you guys go about it in a way where you're like, yes, like this is my personal branding and I'm posting it on my personal stuff. But the point of it is to tell stories. Like the, the point of it is not for me to um, like gain followers and, and monetize. Like I, I just want to tell stories and be genuine in this industry. And I think that's the coolest part of it. And like, especially like once I shot Paige for Bleacher Report after that, like I just knew her and I wanted to go out and shoot her games. So I didn't get paid to go out and shoot all of her games last year. I was doing it completely for free, just on my own, because I, I liked Paige and I liked the other Hopkins girls that I was shooting with. And I thought it was so cool to get the chance to document the, their games and honestly, like history with Paige being on that team. And um, I did it for free on my own dime, just yeah, and posted it on my personal um, Instagrams and then um, built a relationship with Paige and her mom. And then this summer, Sports Illustrated called Paige's mom and she was like, hey, do you know anybody who like photographed Paige and has good pictures of Paige that we can include in Sports Illustrated? And Paige's mom like recommended me because of the relationship that I had built up and I had been going out there for free. And then I got to sell my photos to Sports Illustrated of Paige. So um, like something that I was doing for free, just completely genuine, just to tell stories and, you know, be part of history ended up, you know, making me money, even though I wasn't out there to make money. So I think that's like a good example of how people at least starting out can, can do stuff for free. And then you never know when somebody's going to want to buy your work or hire you just because they see that you're doing it because you love it. And you want to, you want to tell these stories. It is amazing and partly absurd we do this because of our passion for sports and storytelling. And then these opportunities come our way again, we're not looking for it, mm -hmm. but they happen. And it just goes to show that you never know what can happen when you put your work out there and people start picking up on it. I'm curious, Bree, and I'm not looking for dirt per se or scoops, but what have you gained? What are some memories, moments, that you have gained with these relationships that you've built with the likes of Paige Beckers and Jalen Suggs, Chet Holmgren. I'm not sure who else you've fostered friendships with, but when you consider how this avenue has led to these friendships, I mean, how many would love to be on some sort of level with Paige Beckers, but you put in the work to earn her trust and gain that respect. And I'm grateful for that. What are some moments, memories, stories that symbolize the friendships you have built with these athletes, their families, and others involved in sports? 
Yeah, it's it's really special. Like Chet, um, Chet asked me to do a senior pictures after, and Chet was the same thing. Um, I knew about Minnehaha. I had never been out to shoot their games, but I had been watching them and paying attention to Chet, especially after he blew up from the Steph Curry thing. But I had never taken the initiative to reach out to him or try to photograph him. And then Bleacher Report asked me to do that feature. And then once I met Chet and started, you know, talking to him and building that relationship, then from there on out, I started shooting their games and then I built a relationship with Jalen. So like, again, that was all organic and like those two, like, it's just so cool to like be around them and see like their personality when they're comfortable around people. I mean, like you can probably feel the same thing once you get to know people as a media person, then they're just much more open and like, not as, you know, um, closed up or hesitant or whatever. And just that is, that is fun in itself, but then having them like recommend you to other athletes or like say like this best photographer out, like those are just really cool moments because, um, it, it's like not easy to get to that point because they are covered by so many people, but to hear them like favor you in situations is awesome. And then like with Paige, like, um, she's just so special. Like she is someone who I'll be lifelong friends with just because, um, she's just an awesome person with an awesome family. And like, I, when I shot Paige's, uh, like Jersey shoot this summer with all of her, uh, like slam and McDonald's all American and Jordan brand stuff. Like that was when I got to meet her mom and, um, like really get close with her mom. And then, um, me and her mom formed a relationship and I'm like texting Amy all the time now. And like, she, um, wants me to come out to UConn with her for one of the games so that I can see Paige. And like, I told, um, Amy about my new job the other day and she's like, oh my gosh, Paige will be thrilled. And I'm like, that is so cool to think of like someone like Paige who has everything like going for her. And is just this all-star athlete who will be excited about like my new job. Like she's just such a genuine person. And so, um, I think, yeah, it's just like stories of like, you know, Paige's mom asked me to, um, take pictures of the first basketball hoop that Paige play on when she was younger. And then I, um, made that into a print and put it in frames and shipped it to Gino's house for Christmas. And, um, Paige got to open it like with her UConn team and in front of, in front of Gino and her coaches and stuff. And I was like, what a freaking cool moment that I like had the opportunity to not only like capture this lifelong memory for Paige and like a hoop that was so special to her. Like I just went out there one really cold Minnesota day and was by myself at this small St. Louis park park and took photos of the hoop and, and got them framed. And now it's like hung up on her wall at UConn and something, that hopefully she'll cherish forever. And like Paige's mom is like, Hey, like we, we hope we have more projects like this coming up. We'd love to work on them with you. And so like just being there as like a friend and someone who gets to like text her and like check in on her and know how she's doing and the experiences that she's having, but also like from a professional standpoint to be like someone that they would go to for future stuff is just probably like the two coolest parts. It's really the best of both worlds. Like most everybody else, like Paige is probably the one I'm closest to, but everybody else I try to keep like a, a mainly like professional thing if I'm working with them often, just because um, like, especially with guys, it's different. Like, I feel like girls can get a lot closer and form like closer friendships. Like it's, I'm not going to be hanging out with high school guys per se, but um, yeah, but uh, it's, it's still cool just to like be somebody that they think of for projects or for certain things like to do Chet senior photos was super awesome. And I got to hang out with him that day and learn more about like who he was thinking about for college and just talk about stuff like that. And, but also just about like life. And it's just like, Hey, I'm, I'm here to cover your basketball stuff, but I, I care about you as a person too. So it's, it's fun to have the best of both worlds. Well, I know you're too smart for me to weasel this out of you, but did he give you any clues or is he still? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no clues actually. He, he didn't, you know, he talked about different schools and the ways that they approached him, but I, I actually don't have the inside scoop on that. And if I did, I wouldn't share it, but I don't, I don't have the inside scoop. I have who I think he'll choose, but that is not based on what he told me. <laughs> right. It's based on your own instinct. And I would not ask you to say, oh, where is he considering? I've told parents and coaches all the time. I want that moment to belong to the athletes. So yep. if they want totally. to announce who they're considering, like Maya Naji, I know did that a few others. I'm like, all right, well, it's nice to at least put out a list. And I think to a certain extent, it's smart for the kids to do that because we talk about branding all the time. And even though I have mixed feelings about athletes tweeting their offers, I'm also have to think from their perspective that, Hey, they have to tell their own story. And this is one way to take command of it. You don't have to wait through official media channels when you know, for someone like Paige or Maya Naji and Adalia mm -hmm. McKenzie, for example, when she announced she's going to Illinois, you don't have to wait for the big boys. You can announce it. And just because of who you are, you have, 
a following who will sh share that information and take care of the rest. Uh, but yep. it is cool. When you mentioned the stories about Paige, it got me thinking to the friendships I've built up with athletes. Uh, I know I often follow up with them after a podcast or a game and we're pen pals and Love that. It, it, well, and it's funny because, okay, maybe I'm not close friends with the top name athletes, but that's okay. You know, that's not why I'm doing it, but I have yep. built up friendships with so many others. Some that are still in high school, some that graduated college and are now professionals. Uh, one of them actually wants to have me involved in her content line. That's when you know Thanks. you've been doing this for too long. When <laughs> <laughs> players you covered in high school are now reaching out to you as adults and going, hey, Mike. So if you ever get to that point, Bree, uh, that might be time. It might be time to hang it up. I'm kidding. Hey, I have a feeling I'll get to that point. So there, the day is coming. <laughs> I could see it now. I Paige is going to approach you with all of these ideas, and she'll want you. Oh, with I would that be. So, I would be so lucky for that opportunity because she's a rock star. But well, she, yeah, I got the chance to meet her father. It was funny. I told you this beforehand. Her father knew who I was long before I knew who any of her family was, but it goes back to the semi-pro team that I covered, which I did just to get experience uh, because it's harder to do as a broadcaster mm -hmm. uh, when high school is in their off season and my other jobs make it difficult for me to cover AAU. So like, Hey, there's a semi-pro team. All right. And her dad remembered that. And so years later he started following me. I'm like, why would he want to follow me? I haven't covered his daughter yet. And then he explained it. I'm going, oh, and that led to me working my way in with the Hopkins team in some capacity. Again, the problem with me is so many schools want me at their games and there's only one of me. It's gotten to a point where I think I've expanded as far north as Becker, for example, mm -hmm. and it won't be long before <laughs> schools even further away from them would be like, hey, but yep. you just go along with the ride and uh, he and I would share a few texts when Paige had some big moments. I mean, how many folks get to be interviewed by Brianna Stewart before they even set foot in college? Like insane. that is insane. You know, you and I would kill for the chance to interview Brianna Stewart. I have interviewed Brianna on a couple of occasions, but to have a fellow UConn great interview, somebody who is now passing and breaking everyone else's records. We thought yep. Maya Moore and Brianna Stewart were a big deal. You and I joked that this could be a Paige Becker's appreciation podcast if we wanted, because you and I both watched her 30 point game yep. uh, beating South Carolina in overtime. And she dropped another 20 plus game last night after struggling against Seton Hall in the first half and then uh, winning convincingly. So I think you and I, even though I regret not covering her more often, I have to go back to, well, that gave you a chance to cover other athletes whose stories maybe weren't being told. Yep. But as fans, I have to imagine you and I are both excited to see Paige succeed this early. Like I figured when you go to UConn, that says something. I wasn't sure if they would throw her in right away, but she's flourishing. Yeah, she's, it's so awesome. Like I you know, we're not surprised, but like, you also never know like how somebody's going to adjust from high school to college, but Paige was just so clearly a star and somebody that, you know, I, I wouldn't have maybe guessed she would get like five 30 point games in a row, but I'm also still like not surprised because she's just that great. And yes, it's been awesome to see her success. And, and like, you can probably agree, see the world, see her success as well. Like she's, she's getting recognition from everywhere um, with people noticing her. So it's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm just excited about the attention that she's bringing to women's hoops because she's, she's a big impact on that. Much like Maya Moore did and Brianna mm -hmm. Stewart and Tiana Tarazi, one of your idols, Candace Parker, if we go back the 96 yep. Olympic team, you and I could probably, we would need more than a couple of hours to fit all of our inspirations for women's basketball. Totally. But I can't wait to see what's next for Paige. I'm curious, Bree, with Paige and Jalen now graduated, of course, you'll still be involved with athletics and covering high school teams, but what are some of your goals or ideas with those two now in college, you know, barring a chance that you get an opportunity to 
be a photographer for one of their games in College of the Pros. What's next for you as far as the continuation of fostering the relationships that you've built with athletes like Paige and Jalen and Chet? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that whole thing has changed during COVID. I'm still able to get out to some games, but getting individual access to high school games is a lot harder. Um, and so I think we'll kind of, it's kind of up in the air. Like, I think it's just going to be um, trying to get out to, you know, the same games that I've been at at Creighton and Hopkins and Minnehaha, but then also just trying to expand that and find, you know, I've had other um, high school girls reach out and want me to do photographs for them. And I've had, I have a friend who is the assistant coach for Anoka and who wants me to get out to some of her games. And so I think it's just um, kind of like starting from the beginning where I did with like Paige and, and them is just going out to games and trying to tell stories. And then from there, if it builds into, um, you know, relationships with the athletes, then that's great. But I really just love watching basketball and being out at games and everything. And so um, yeah, now I, you know, the full-time role that I took now is remote. So hopefully I'll have a lot more opportunities to like travel and then continue those relationships while they're in college and like get out to a couple of pages games and, and do a little more widespread coverage than just, um, local Minnesota basketball, but we'll see. I think it's going to be, it'll be up in the air, but hopefully once, once COVID is over, I'll kind of have a better, a uh, better plan of attack for how I'm going to get out to the games and foster those relationships. I know once it's safe to get back out there, uh, look out because I'm going to make up for lost time, or at least that's the hope. Right. Speaking of your new position, it's something in your wheelhouse as far as social media is concerned, but Locker Room, it's an audio only app or an audio only organization, which is a new wrinkle in your journey, your path with your multimedia versatility. So what are you excited about with this new position? You said it's remote, which offers a lot of flexibility, but it also presents a challenge in that the focus isn't going to be visual all the time. It's all about audio. And so I imagine you're going to get some practice when it comes to sharing stories that are audio only, like you would see in NPR or the radio station. So what are you looking forward to with this opportunity and what challenges are you excited to face? That seems like a weird question to ask, but if you weren't willing to take it on, I don't think you would have applied and accepted this position. Definitely. Yeah, it, it is going to be a challenge. I think there's a couple of things like when, when I started out as sports engine, it was covering the Nike YPL. And then I got some other like awesome opportunities like final four and rural media day. But um, towards the end of my time at sports engine, I was really, really focused on like youth sports and youth leagues and, um, we're talking even lower than like the high school athletes we're talking about. And so I kind of started to like, you know, get farther and farther away of my passions, like the D one circuit thing went away. So I couldn't cover the Nike YPL anymore. And, um, I was like, how do I get back to like, you know, like this, just sports fandom that I have of like watching and talking about sports and creating communities around sports. And so, um, locker room is a really good fit because I, while it is an audio app, I do get to lead their social media. Um, right now it's just Twitter and Instagram, but I'm going to be able to build up the communities on those platforms. And that's really exciting for me. Um, they don't necessarily have like a, like a marketing or a brand or a social person. So I will be the only one. And I think that's, will be challenging. That will probably be the challenge is just doing it on my own. But that's also the super exciting part is I, I'm going to be like the copywriter and the social strategist and the graphic designer and the storyteller all in one. And I personally get to build up this community. And I, like I've talked about so much, the sports community in general is just small, but it's powerful. And there's so many awesome people and um, creating conversation in the sports community is so much fun. And that's like almost what, you know, makes NBA Twitter and, and sports Twitter um, what it is. And so um, I think just the opportunity to like cultivate a community for the locker room social is exciting, but then also um, getting to experience the audio side as well and like host my own rooms around maybe women in sports and, you know, be a speaker on there and then have other women listen in and get advice or, um, you know, have a sports creative um, room where I, we all get to talk about, you know, how we got into sports or photography or, or whatever like that. And so um, you know, we see clubhouse, which is a new app that's not sports focused, but audio focused. And that's just growing because people are 
finding out that, you know, similar to Twitter, that you can get a lot of information for free on these apps and you get a lot of insight and um, networking from these apps that you can't get elsewhere. And, you know, like Twitter is a great networking app. I don't think Instagram is that great, but I think that this um, app gives people a voice as well. And it allows, you know, not only they've had warrior players on and um, like Robbie Hummel and other big players have been on. And, and so like people like normal people who wouldn't normally get to have conversations with these athletes or these coaches or these media people that they follow on Twitter now get the opportunity to join their room and maybe get up on stage and talk with them and create conversation and um, create more, more of a community in sports. So I think um, it's always about building a community for me and telling and telling stories and connecting people through sports. I think that's what it's all about. And I think, um, while this is different um, than what I've done, like from a visual perspective, I think there will still be opportunities for for me to create um, content visually on on through a social platform as well. But I'm excited for the audio side because I love podcasts and I love um, listening to insiders and and hot takes and all the in between. So um, I'm excited to experiment in it and kind of see like it's 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 honestly exciting right now. Like to just to see the people that are into the app and that use it so much and know each other from locker room and so. So um, I'm excited to be a part of like that new community and, and help build it up. There are a few more points I wanted to touch on as we continue this conversation, Bree, that I ask all of my guests. As an athlete, what would you say was the most exciting moment and the most embarrassing moment? And feel free to extrapolate that to include your work in media. And just to be clear, by embarrassing, I don't mean like, ha ha, anything like astonishing or ghastly but something oh, I have something right what's well, just something silly you did that you're like I can't believe that happened but go ahead I've got I've got that one um I will say the most exciting thing for me was um shooting photographing the national championship for men's basketball uh, college basketball that was um amazing I got to shoot the final four games and then the national championship when Virginia beat Texas Tech in overtime that was in Minneapolis and that was amazing um, from an embarrassing moment, my sophomore year of high school, I was on the JV team for basketball and I got a rebound when the other team shot it and I put it right back up and shot at the wrong basket and gave them two points and we almost lost the game by two, but luckily we didn't, but it did count for them and um, I don't think my high school teammates will ever let me live down shooting, uh, shooting at the wrong basket. My coach had just been like literally hammering off it, like hammering offensive rebounding. Like we were practicing it like all the time in practice. And so I don't know why I thought I was getting an offensive rebound and putting it back up. And after the other team had just shot it, but, um, yeah, that is definitely the most embarrassing that I don't think I've shared it anywhere else. So that's insider info for you right there. Um, <laughs> At least no one can doubt your hustle, right? Exactly, right? I mean, you know, it, like there was still hustle. It was just for the wrong side. Actually, Bree, you may not know this, and maybe you do. That miscue gives you a shared distinction with Swin Cash. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Only in Swin Cash's case, it happened while she was at UConn. Oh, really? That I, I think didn't know. I think the clip of it is still up on YouTube. It was UConn, UCLA. I forget what year she was. It was a free throw. She got the rebound. UCLA was at the line. I think they made the first miss the second. She gets the rebound and then hits a mid-range J and then realizes that she scored on the wrong hoop. And you could see the look of terror on her face. Gino Oriema was just laughing it off because one of those moments you just bow to the absurd. But Literally, yes. Yeah, you have something in common with Swin Cash. You both scored on the wrong basket at one point in your athletic career. Honestly, wow. Like I, you know, that makes me feel a lot better. And I can't imagine doing it in college, but I'm so glad that Gino laughed it off. That's awesome. Because I was not laughing. I was embarrassed, very embarrassed. <laughs> well, she was embarrassed too. I think as a player, that's your worst nightmare is scoring totally. on the wrong basket, but everyone else you're like, all right, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> it's like, yeah. You just, you just go with it. And, and you've gotten to see Gino and he, I think he's one of those guys. He has a sense of humor about him. So he, even with UConn's big wins, he was always talking about how they ought to get better or working to get better. And I like that, you know, you don't want to get complacent with those runaway wins, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's like, he'd been around the sport a long time and what are you going to do? <laughs> 
totally. silly things happen. You I mean in basketball and in sports. Um, but I did not know you got to shoot the final four too. I'm going, man, final four all-star game. What haven't you covered yet? I got very, I got very lucky. Um, yeah, that was through sports engine and NBC sports got media access and, um, got to interview the athletes and then take photos there. I was, I wasn't on the court. I was in like the media section. Um, so I had to shoot from there, but it was still amazing for sure. Hey, that's still something on the resume. Like you were at that game and you have photos, you've got proof. And even when, so if anybody tries to give you flack, it's like, no, I got the proof right in this pudding, right? Here. <laughs> no doubt. I, I feel like such an underachiever now. I'm kidding. Oh, no, no, no. I'm no, no. I, I have yet to cover a final four, but maybe someday. Uh, another thing that I like to ask, and this is actually based on a book that I get each year to give me cliff notes on the teams for the high school circuit. What would you say is the most unusual thing about yourself that people wouldn't necessarily know if they met you for the first time? Hmm. Um, that's a, gosh, that's, I should honestly have an answer prepared for this because this was something that I used to ask the kids on the EYBL too. Um, so I am like totally not taking my own advice on being prepared, but I would probably say like, uh, the couple interesting things I would say that I know how to knit, like I used to knit a lot of scarves. So that was kind of like my old lady trait. And then also I am just extremely clumsy and uncoordinated. I have like fallen off the front of an electric scooter while riding that once and messed my face up. I've fallen while running and tripping over a crack and messing my face up. I fall upstairs often. I, I don't know how I was an athlete because I am just like a walking, like unlucky disaster. But, um, yeah, between that, like, I, I haven't had any like embarrassing clumsy moments that I can think of at like any media events or anything, but like one time somebody, chucked a ball from full court um with one hand like a baseball to try to get it down to them and I was like on my phone or out looking at my camera or something and I got smacked in the chest with the ball that was um thrown very far and I kind of you know like coughed and everybody was paying attention to me and um that would be like my only like probably clumsy or non-paying attention moment but yeah I'm I'm a pretty uncoordinated person but not when it comes to handling the camera, right? No, thankfully, gosh, <laughs> knock on wood, because something could happen someday, but. So, hey, at least you know where your strengths are or you put your concentration. So when you when you have that camera, when you have that big lens, you have a razor sharp focus. So at exactly. least you, your focus matters where it counts. Everywhere totally. else, I think you can afford to be clumsy. Totally. <laughs> well, you mentioned clumsy and I, do my best to keep my wits about me. I've told this story a few times. I guess you could put this under clumsy or embarrassing or both. I've said this a few times on the podcast and I'll say it here to see what your reaction is because you can understand this. Once in a WNBA game, I walked into a locker room while the entire Atlanta Dream roster was changing out of, the, out of, the, out of their uniform. Not oh, by, not oh. on purpose. So a security guard thought we were cleared to do uh, post-game interviews. And so oh, I walk in the locker boy. room. Uh, obviously, we weren't clear. And so to see everyone changing out of their jerseys, you're like, uh, this ain't going to work. So I, I see what happened. And then I just turn around and get out of there as quick as I could. Uh, yeah, I bet. Um, I feel like I would have felt the same way that you did doing that. And um, having com being completely innocent, just being told to go in there from the security guard and then I was going to ask if you ran away first or if somebody yelled you out of there first. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I ran out of there first because yeah. <laughs> you can put two and two together. Sure. Here's a dude in a locker room full of women that could go south in a hurry if you're not careful. Sure. So sure, sure you could. don't have to. Uh, and it's like, no, I, uh, I, it was a late friend of mine who got me access to covering the WNBA at a time when the Lynx weren't championship contenders. So I'm not good about to throw that away on something right. like that. Oh no, I, I've learned early on. I've actually said women's sports uh, has been helpful in connecting me with people who don't look like me and just it, illustrating, imbibing this concept that women can go just as hard as the men and be just as talented and athletic and graceful. In, 
Paige Beckers comes to mind, for example, and before mm-hmm. her, Nia Coffey was a big deal. Nia Holly, I know, got a lot of press when she won Miss Basketball. Taylor Hill, I got to cover several games from her career when she was the household name. And then I got to see Rachel Bantam grow from this high school athlete all the way to this professional who made something out of nothing, you know, didn't get the hoopla, the fanfare, the Paige Beckers did. So no, like if that were to happen again, hopefully it, that doesn't, but if it does, trust me, I will be the first to get out of there. Like <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. being a former athlete yourself, you could imagine how awkward it would be if somebody walked into a locker room while you were changing. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> With all the experiences you had, and I'm not sure what people make of the citizens from Mason City, if they expect them to go far or what life is like. I've been through Iowa a few times, and again, no pro sports, so a lot of the focus is on the college towns, Iowa, uh, Iowa. I was like Iowa City, that's where Iowa was, Mike. You, don't overthink this, you're doing fine. Uh, Iowa, Drake, Northern Iowa, where you went to Iowa State, multiple D1 schools. But again, outside of that, kind of known as a farm state, a lot of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So when you look at all of your experiences and maybe some of the tropes you had to contend with being an Iowa native, what would you tell a younger version of yourself? Um. I would say to dream big. I think in Iowa, you can feel confined and limited to your surroundings because you just grow up not knowing what the rest of the world is like. And you um, don't know what you just don't know what you don't know. And you don't know what's out there. And I think um, the best advice I would give to my younger self is like the world is your oyster and you can really do anything that you want to do and don't let where you're from or your experiences confine you to a certain area or job or industry. Um, whatever you want to do, or if you dream of something that you wish you could do, like you could actually do it and um, put in the work and, and achieve it. And going back to the start of our conversation where you said you had no idea five years ago that you would find yourself covering Nike EYBL, the final four, the WNBA all-star game, chronicling Paige Beckers and Chet Holmgren, through their high school careers. And who knows, maybe we'll see what a UConn game before uh, Paige turns pro. I'm comfortable making that prediction because if she's breaking records of her fellow UConn greats as a freshman, scouts aren't going to pass that up. (laughs) When you look at the number one draft picks that have come out of UConn, but I don't think anyone knows what the future is going to hold, especially as we try to get through this pandemic, but what are you most excited about in your journey? And maybe what are some events, venues, leagues, something that you would love to get the opportunity to cover now that you have experience being on hand for so many high profile events? Yeah, I think um, some goals of mine would probably be, I would love to cover a WNBA or an NBA championship. Um, I would also love to cover a WNBA women's college um, basketball championship since I got to do the men's side. Um, I also would love to try out other sports. Um, I am interested in maybe trying out football or soccer or tennis someday because those are all sports that I like to watch as well. And I just kind of want to expand and see what else I like because I've done so much basketball. Um, And other than that, I think um, I'd love to like do, you know, something with Paige or something with the athletes that I build up relationships with in the future, like partnershipping with like maybe they partner with a brand and I get to do the photography for that shoot or um, if they partner with a brand and need social media help or something like that. Like I would just love to like help them um, since they've helped me, you know, grow in my career and, um, allowed like me to showcase them as athletes. Like I would love to help them from that side too. So, um, partnering or collaborating with the athletes in the future or, um, just shooting s- some other bigger events would, would be a dream for sure. I'm sure those opportunities will come your way. You won't have to search too hard for them. Now that Paige has you on speed dial, for example, I think that is wonderful to hear for an athlete that gets so much attention, so much hype and never makes it about herself. That's what I admired most about her. 
And likewise with the Minnehaha boys team, people can't get enough of them. There was a time and their athletic director has noted this when that wasn't the case. You know, they'd won some state titles, but they didn't become a household name in nationwide prep basketball. They're going to get featured on ESPN again in a few days through ESPNU. And I'm going, that is insane. And that leads to a whole nother conversation too about chasing popularity that maybe you and I can have. Because I'll never forget last year where the boys got featured on ESPN twice, the girls who were the defending champions and had the all-time leading score in history on their roster before she went to Dartmouth, they didn't get much as far as the major TV networks. Now, it's not a fair comparison, for example, because Minnehaha is a very special exception. The boys were, but I'm going, hey, the girls have some athletes too that you might want to hear about. Totally. But I guess that's where you and I come in. We help fill in those gaps, whether we're covering the big name teams or the schools that don't get as much exposure. But something tells me you won't have a hard time getting those opportunities because they're going to remember your work and your authenticity. I mean, you're talking about striking up a friendship with Paige. That's not something you can create simply from a photo shoot. Like you invested in that relationship and it's paying dividends. So every time she notches another milestone at UConn, I know you're going to be one of the first to cheer her on. Definitely. And I can't wait to see what comes next. Maybe you and I will end up crossing paths at some point if we find a way back into the WNBA. <laughs> I have a, I have a feeling, I have a feeling that will happen someday. Yeah. It's uh yeah, who knows what will happen, but I definitely see us crossing paths once once things get back to normal. But um, yeah, thank thank you for all the questions and everything. It was it was super awesome. Indeed, and I feel like I only scratched the surface. I'm like, what other events have you covered that we didn't get to talk about yet? But uh, we got to save something for next time. You know, if we talk about everything now, we have nothing to look forward to. There you go. <laughs> but I will say this: I know I put the word out with a few of my old contacts in the WNBA media sphere. But if any of them are watching and you need someone to get back on the link speed, I'm considering a return now because it was clear. I think it was clear from the start. They didn't look at it as a rebuild where, okay, we're going to struggle for a few years. They found a way to build through the draft, but they found a way to get better through free agency. I'm going, Hey, this Lynx team, uh, we might be looking at a new dynasty, perhaps. A lot can happen, of course, in sure. any pro league. But for everyone wondering, like, oh, now they're going to stink for a while. I remember a time where there were fans thinking that they should struggle for a year or two because they weren't getting high draft picks. It's like, uh, you underestimate the shrewdness of Cheryl Reeve. She knows how to sign big name free agents and she knows how to find gold in the draft when you pick six, you know, it's not the number one slot. So you're thinking, okay, maybe an impact player. And she got two rookies of the year out of it. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. She's, she's the real deal. And I think the links will be, will be awesome this year. So hopefully we get to, we get to check out a couple of those games. Well, I'm sure Rachel will love to hear that assessment of her <laughs> team. Yeah, Rachel no Bantam that is, uh, but Hey, even if Rachel Bantam wasn't on the team, I think there are a lot of reasons that they're worth checking out. I know I gained a lot from my 10 years. And after a while, you're like, hey, I think uh, it's worth giving another shot at it. The kicker for me, and this would be more of a timing thing, but it would be hilarious if for me, I somehow return if Maya decides to come back because she left after 2018. That's when I took my years off. And I'm going, what are the odds? Destiny, fate, something will conspire and set it up where... <laughs> we returned at the same time and I'll get flack for it. Jokingly, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, but that's, that's what I loved about covering the links and Cheryl Reeve and that crew is you can tell she works hard and she uh, puts in a lot of effort for her players, but she knows how to have fun too. And that's something I can tell from this interview with you and all of the events that you cover, you're grateful for the opportunity. You know, you don't see it as, Hey, look at me or look at all the followers I can get. It's more, Hey, whatever happens with Paige Beckers, Chet Holmgren, and so many of the other athletes you've had a chance to witness. As you said before, Hopkins, they have a lot of up-and-comers in their roster, and 
when their time in the spotlight comes, you're going to have an archive that you can reference and celebrate their achievements just like you did with Paige. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah, um, it will be it'll be exciting to see them kind of like grow and develop. And that will be probably the most fun part about about starting with high school. But um, yeah, I, I am about to go watch this gopher game because Kendall is on my butt because we only have one TV and it's currently right not on. So I know he's trying to get to watch the, the gopher men's game versus Purdue tonight for all the gopher fans turning in. But um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your time and for the questions and um, your coverage of women's hoop honestly is, is great. And I'm glad that they have you as an advocate. Well, I appreciate that, Bree. Well, enjoy the game. And uh, hopefully if the Gophers and you and I ever meet in the future, you and Kendall can work <laughs> out how that uh, allegiance would fare. <laughs> Go Cats. Go Cats. That's all okay. I'll say. <laughs> all right. That, that's the only the one matchup where the two of you are on separate sides. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> well, Bree Lewerke, you can find her, of course, as a social content lead on Locker Room. And when it's safe again, I'm sure you will see here with that camera lens shooting all of the future athletes, the future generations of leaders that we will be witnessing in the high school ranks and beyond. So be sure to check out her work. And if you want to be a future guest on this podcast, just contact us at the Mike Peden on Twitter or Instagram. All you need is a good story and we'd be happy to share it. So until next time, thanks for watching. Thank you.